Yeah, thank you, Alan. Uh, thank you for the, the kind introduction and also the invitation you know, from the JQI for me to come here and share uh, you know, our experience in you know, trying to take some of this spooky technology out of the lab and trying to deploy them. Oh, hang um, on one second. I forgot one thing. He's also uh, 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 the quantum guy at the Singapore National uh, Quantum Effort. So he's apparently the only one there who knows what he's doing. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks, thanks, Alan. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I'm happy to take any questions later about you know, the Singapore uh, quantum ecosystem, if you guys have any. Um, but you know, coming back to the next 60 minutes, I'd like to share our experience you know, and also some of the lessons that we have learned in trying to you know, take entanglement technology you know, out of the lab and, and trying to deploy it. As Alan said, uh, you know, uh, this is a play on, on the problem that Einstein had. And I think you know all space missions need a logo and they need a, you know some some kind of fancy name. So I, I challenged my my team of students and postdocs to come up with it, and they they said we should call our satellite the Spooky Satellite. And um, for the students who are going to ask questions, I actually have little uh, incentives. I'll give you a little mission patch uh, from the Spooky mission. So please ask questions. Okay, so what we do in my laboratory? It's, it's, yes. It must be an acronym for something. What's it an acronym for? It's not an acronym. Really? Yeah, this one doesn't have an it acronym. Just, it, it, but it's, sure. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Sometimes I have acronyms and acronyms, yeah, but it's like Jilla. It's just. <laughs> yeah, Jilla. These used to be done. Challenge, challenge is to come up with them. Right? Yeah, yeah, that's true. I guess. I was thinking space, project, you know. Ah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. We, we, we had a funny one for the, the, the source, the entangled photon source in sight is SPEQS or specs. Because actually we were thinking that the satellite is like a tiny speck up in the sky, right? And so we'll call it specs for small photon entangling quantum system if you wanted to. So that's an acronym inside the satellite. <laughs> <laughs> well, Bill, Bill is a good friend of Singapore. He comes by, you know, regularly. I'll, I'll give him two patches. <laughs> right. So as I was saying, um, you know, with Alan, you know, we, we've been you know, looking at in, uh, single photon sources, entangled photon sources. And typically, if you go into a laboratory, they will look like this. We, we generate entangled photon sources using nonlinear optics, uh, spontaneous parametric down conversion where you have a, a, a pump light from a laser, you interact with a nonlinear crystal, and then typically entangled photons will come out in two paths. And so what we tried to do was we tried to look at something like this, which is relatively large, it's on the size of a table, and see whether we could actually innovate and try and you know, squeeze this technology down into something relatively small right, that we could actually put onto small satellites. The reason why we want to do this um, is, you know, we, we want to work uh, on, you know, entanglement distribution technology for quantum networks. This is a map of Singapore. Singapore is relatively small; it's about 40 kilometers across, uh, and 20 kilometers this way, north to south. And at the moment, what we are doing is we are linking up, you know, the universities and commercial partners who want to explore the technology with optical fibers. Um, so over here, the western node and the southern nodes, um, this is where a lot of the research universities and data centers are, are, are located. So we, we have them all linked up with optical fiber, and we are doing quantum key distribution uh, on this network first. But because the fiber is already there and is linking up the universities, we also have plans to do, to do generic entanglement distribution, uh, or bell state measurements between different types of single photon sources. Now, it's nice to have a quantum safe network uh, in Singapore, but we would also like to link the Singapore network with other networks overseas. Uh, and this is where at the moment we believe that the satellites have a role to play because they can actually, um, you know, in terms of quantum key distribution, there can be a single trusted node in space. Uh, but you can also think of you know, understanding the space environment so that perhaps you could think of putting quantum memories on board the satellites so that they can store you know, entanglement information uh, over Singapore and then you know, 
fly over another ground station and then release those photons to another ground station. But this is you know, a work in progress. And what we want to do is we want to slowly build up the understanding of what it means to work in the space environment. Now, the main reason why we, we are going to space using satellites to bridge the networks is because of loss. So optical fibers have exponential loss, right? And we can't actually, uh, we don't actually know how to build quantum repeaters yet. So in the meantime, uh, the satellites are actually a nice way to bridge the gap. If you use satellites, there is a, a few configurations you can think of. Um, typically, there would be a satellite above the ground station. And in one way, you can have an uplink. For example, you can have an entangled photon source linked to your network down here. Then the satellite can actually carry receivers or detectors, and you could send the, the, the signal up this way. Uh, more commonly, we would have entangled photon sources on the satellite, and then we would actually transmit them down uh, to the ground station. In these examples of uplink and downlink, um, you know, there's, if you have entangled photons, you would keep one of them locally, right at the source, and then the receiver would be far away. Um, if you have an entangled photon source, you could also do a double downlink, right, where you can see two satellites at the same, uh, two ground stations at the same time. You can distribute the, the, the photons, or you could even do inter-satellite uh, communications. And this is actually pretty exciting because now you can imagine that you also have a spacecraft that is further away from the Earth, right? And you can actually do a deep space link where you can actually distribute entanglement between them and maybe push the, the distance limits in which we are testing quantum correlations. Now, as we all know, our Chinese colleagues are actually quite far ahead, right? They have already shown that a lot of these concepts work in space. Um, the Misha satellite uh, has been operational for quite a few years, and they have been showing or demonstrating the, you know, the primitives of quantum information. Uh, they, have done, they, have got, they have two types of transmitters on board. They have an entangled photon source. They also have what is known as a, a decoy state, QKD transmitter, which is a laser uh, where the pulses are attenuated down to approximately a single photon. And using these two sources, they have demonstrated you know, entanglement distribution from the satellite. They've shown quantum key distribution. And in, in fact, they've also distributed signals, quantum signals, uh, to other countries, for example, in Canada and in Austria. Uh, and they can use those signals and derive a, a secret key that they can use to sort of show the, the proof of concept uh, for intercontinental quantum safe communication. And it's still operational. Uh, since 2016. The other thing is our Chinese colleagues also have quantum transmitters on an, on an unmanned space station. Right? They've been using that to show quantum key distribution. And just a few weeks ago, they announced that they have launched uh, a second uh, satellite into space, which is smaller than, than Mishis. Mishis was a 600-kilogram uh, satellite, and I understand that the, the new one is about 100 kilograms in size. So they're really you know, pushing forward to understand how you actually build constellations of quantum communication satellites in space. Now, what do we do in Singapore, right? Uh, which is diff of a different flavor from the, the Misha satellite. So what we do is that we try to see what's the smallest you know, spacecraft right, that can actually be used to host uh, entanglement technology, right? And it turns out that about the time when I was you know, starting my lab in Singapore, uh, about 12 years ago, uh, a new paradigm for spacecraft was emerging. Uh, this was known as the CubeSats. Um, the, the satellite industry likes to call them nanosatellites, but there's nothing nano in scale about them. Okay? They're more, you should think of them as, as small cube satellites. And here's a comparison. This is uh, the internals of the, the Misha uh, spacecraft, whereas this is the, in, the complete satellite that my team was trying to build. Okay? And it's called a cube satellite because this object here is made up of three cubes, 10 centimeter cubes that are stacked together. And in principle, each 10 centimeter cube is a complete satellite with a radio, with battery, uh, with a microprocessor, it's also surrounded by solar panels so that it'll charge up after deployment in space. 
and you can use the, the solar power to actually run your experiments. So what we, we decided to do was we decided to see whether we could use CubeSat technology to gain experience about how we would operate in space. Okay? And we decided that we wanted to do this uh, step by step. First, we wanted to gain an experience of the space env environment. Uh, Alan's already said that it's, it's, it's not a nice neighborhood. Uh, the vacuum in space is bad, okay? at least in low of orbit. It's bad, and it's actually not very cold. It's actually kind of warm, but actually that works in our favor. Okay? And, and I'm talking about the low of orbit environment. In order to get the really cold temperatures and, and really ultra high vacuum, uh, situations, you need to go much further into space. But within our, our neighborhood, it's, it's, not, it's not as uh, cold or as, as low pressure as people think it is. Now, when we come to the nanosatellites, our first thing to do was we wanted to use it to host you know, the devices that we need to generate entanglement and to detect entanglement. These are lasers, these are single photon detectors, uh, you know, coincidence circuits. And we wanted to show that they would actually operate in, in space. And the nanosatellites are a good way to do that. But we also started to think whether it was actually possible that one day you, yes? Since the last slide the, in the title said cheaper, what is the cost scale of this? The cost scale of this. So typically for a 3U cube set, you can actually buy all the parts online. Right? There, there, there are companies, there's like a catalog, you can go and choose which parts you want and they'll ship it to you. Um, a single one U probably would cost you about $25,000. Okay? And then, uh, then you, you buy a three U, um, still it's not going to be that much, maybe seventy five dollars to $80,000. Because the rest of the volume is up to you. Then it's up to you to decide what experiment you want to design that you could put into it. And then to get into space, um, it's getting relatively cheap because you can, you can do an Uber-like service and share the rockets with other spacecraft because it's so small. Are you going to show a picture of your first launch? I will, I will. Okay. Okay. I noticed that there's a question mark after smaller, faster, cheaper. Usually we say smaller, faster, cheaper, choose any two. Yes. So did you really choose three? <laughs> That's a good question. That's why we have a question mark. Um, we think that if you're willing to, to, to compromise on some, some aspects of performance, you may be able to get all three. Because I think the, the thing is, these satellites are not going to be quite far into space. They're relatively close to Earth. So it means that in about two years, the Earth's atmosphere would drag them back in and they would burn up. So the lifetime is not going to be that long. So if you're willing to, to live with that kind of trade-off, it is actually possible to to get all three. But again, some people sell that as an advantage because a lot of the electronics in the CubeSats are commercial <coughs> off the shelf. And they argue that um, the rapid pace of electronics is, is going so quickly that sometimes it makes sense to just replace the components on, on a faster uh, scale. So, so these things are designed to be sort of thrown out of the bay of a, uh, uh, maybe the ISS rather mm -hmm. than going into a rack in the ISS? Yes, so I think you could also operate it in a rack. Uh, I think NanoRacks is, is one of these uh, service providers. They do accept experiments of a particular size that can go onto the rack in the space station. But the CubeSat in particular is designed to, to fly free. Yeah. Yes? So for the telemetry and then the sort of maintenance and orbital So the telemetry, you will depend on radios. There's a radio built in, uh, you, there's, and there are standards for it. So if you buy the components from an established company, you can just use their protocols. So for example, um, I, we bought from GOMSPACE, a, a Danish company, and they provide the radios and the, the protocols. And in fact, it worked really well. The satellite was like a, a node on the internet, like a private network, that you could actually just uh, write a command into your computer and it will send the commands to the satellite and it will transmit back. I guess what I mean is someone must maintain, there's hundreds of ground stations on the Earth, 
is there a company that's providing access to those ground stations and then an API for just sending packets to your satellite? Right, so right. Maintaining its orbit. Yeah. They do all that for you. There, there is. Now there are companies that will do that for you. Okay, you can choose to do that or you can do it yourself. Uh, so we did it ourselves. Uh, because the radio technology that's required is UHF. It's not very complicated. But there are some challenges which I'll share with you later in my talk. So since the satellites have a more cubicle form factor, would that enable you to like put a bunch in a single rocket and just kind of launch them all at once? Or would there be like other reasons that you wouldn't want to like do that? Oh, you want to do that. And, and the nice thing about because it's cubicle is like a standard, right? Yeah, yeah, you can stack them together, make it a big cube. Um, also, um, it makes the containerization uh, common to all the satellites. And apparently, that's a big deal in space. Uh, you know, imagine you know, if we, global trade wouldn't happen if we didn't have fixed containers. It would be very difficult to ship things around. And apparently, having this, this fixed shape also sort of helped the uh, rocket providers you know, accept more satellites into the spacecraft. Now, you don't launch them all at once uh, because you do want to control the orbits and the separation between the satellites. So there's usually a phased um, release, right? The, the, the providers would decide which satellite gets knocked, uh, kicked out of the rocket first. Right? So there's a sequence. Yeah. Okay, let's, uh, let's move on. So like I was saying, um, we started with the idea that we could just test you know, different components in space, but could we, and then as we looked into the technology, we, we started to get a little bit more ambitious because we felt that there's lots of engineering uh, interest in the satellite platform, and, and there are lots of people you know, innovating on telescopes, on how to actually orientate the satellites uh, much better. So we started to, to, to work with a, a group of colleagues, mostly in Europe, um, about what would be required for a CubeSat to actually be able to transmit quantum signals to a ground receiver. Um, and in this particular model, we looked at a 6U CubeSat, so it's six units, six cubes stuck together. Half of it is dedicated to a satellite with uh, a fine pointing mechanism. <coughs> and then we used an, uh, an Italian ground station as a, as a receiver. Uh, it's a 1.5 meter ground station. And that's when we, we worked out the situation. We said, that, yeah, it's actually possible that you can actually get you know, hundreds of bits per second if the weather conditions were good. Okay? Because this is still a, an optical technology. And so if you have clouds or haze, uh, then you know, it would just uh, affect your link. But if the link was good, it was a clear uh, condition, then one could actually get hundreds of bits of of quantum signal between the satellite and the ground receiver. So this was actually really nice, and it was a, a good motivation for pushing on with developing the sources in space. And this is a little brief history of the sources that we, we have tried to put into space. We started out with, with weather balloons, okay? And, and this guy, this gentleman in the red coat here is Christoph Walfield. Some of you may actually remember him because we were postdocs together in, in Alan's lab. Uh, and we, all, we went our separate ways, and later on when I needed to launch balloons, I realized that uh, Christoph was a great contact because he, he was a radio amateur who would launch balloons and track them. So I worked with Christoph, um, and we launched balloons from Germany and Switzerland. And the, our first experiments were uh, correlated photon sources. So these are very simple parametric down conversion systems where we are producing photon pairs, but they're not entangled in polarization. Right? They're just being produced inside the, the, from the crystal. And then we packed it with two single photon detectors so we could actually monitor them. Um, and they, this, this weather balloons would bring the package up to about uh, 37 kilometers right? before the balloon explodes, and then the package would fall down. But then there's a little parachute that would then deploy in the atmosphere, and it will float down to Earth. Uh, relatively gently. But we managed to, to do this twice, and it worked, and, and the package survived each time. So we, we, we gained a little bit more ex, uh, experience, and then we worked with GOMSpace, the Danish company I talked about, uh, to try and launch the photon pay source into space. And this is the package uh, that we have. So 
This is GOMEX tree, right? And there were multiple experiments on it, and we, we asked for a little slice uh, over here. Okay? And this was supposed to be launched from, from Wallops Island in, in Virginia. Um, unfortunately, the rocket exploded, okay? Uh, and so it didn't get into space. Uh, but a year later, we managed to actually um, launch the same package on another spacecraft, on another satellite. This satellite was built at NUS uh, by, the, by my engineering colleagues, okay? And you think about it, it's pretty amazing that for a space campaign, you could lose a payload and then 12 months later, have a copy of it put onto another satellite, okay? And, and it will launch and it worked and we published the results about it. And just try that with the James Webb telescope. Yeah. <laughs> now, there's a couple of reasons why, why, why we could do that. Um, one of them is because it's not the James Webb telescope. It's not a very expensive thing. But even then, the reason why it could, we could do that is the internals of the CubeSats are standardized. Okay? The interface control to the computers, where you draw power from, they are, there is a standard interface. So it's relatively easy if you design to a standard that you can actually take it around and look for different uh, partners who will be willing to host your experiment for you. Okay? So, so up to this point, we were successful in, in deploying the photon pay source in, in space and seeing that it worked. Now, this is not the end of the story because when we looked at this giant fireball that happened, I got a call from the company about a year later saying that it had recovered the satellite uh, on the beach with a bunch of other CubeSats because these things were going to the International Space Station to be launched. So it was part of the resupply vehicle. Uh, and then they told me that it was intact. So I asked them, could you switch it on? And they said, sure, we'll switch it on. And then, so they switched it on, did some tests, and then they came back to us and said, hey, your, your photon pay source is still working. <laughs> so, so we published a paper called The Photon Pay Source That Survived a Rocket Explosion. Right? And I don't know which one is cooler. Is it the one that we go into space or the fact that we have a bomb-proof photon pay source? Okay? Yeah. But anyway, um, you know, this sort of gave us some, some confidence that we could actually uh, build devices that went into space. And so we decided that our next step would be really to demonstrate polarization entanglement being generated on the small satellites. Okay? And if we could do that, then we can actually think about yeah, in our next mission, how to actually put the photon pay source with a telescope so that we can begin to transmit signals. <coughs> so this is the goal of the, the Spooky One mission, which is to demonstrate an entangled photon pay source in space. Now, keep this in mind. We're doing this step by step. We are not yet talking about transmitting quantum signals out of the satellite, okay? And so what we want to do now is we want to make a, a polarization entangled photon pay source demonstrated in space. Uh, the payload is SPECS2, because SPECS1 was the one launched on the previous satellites. Um, and the mission overview was that it would be deployed to the space station <laughs> Uh, in, in April 2019, and then when the astronauts are free, it would be deployed from the Japanese module uh, in June 2019. So it will spend a few months in storage in space. Um, and then we will try to you know, carry out uh, early operations to commission the satellite, just to make sure that you know, the battery is working, the microcontrollers are working, the radio is fully functional. Right? And then we will enter a science phase where we will begin to, to test the source, to see how, how much entanglement we can generate, how many photon pairs can we generate, uh, whether it's stable, uh, to see whether there's any degradation because we're in space. And then end of life should be about two years or so later, but we weren't very sure whether it was going to be two years because uh, there are a lot of university-built satellites that actually don't operate very uh, for long in space. So. I, I'm going to take a little break here for you guys to ask some questions if you have any. Bill? How do you do the orientation of the satellite and how much uh, has to be expended to keep that orientation to be what, it, what you want it to be? Right. 
So orientation is uh, a big challenge, and, and there are two reasons why people want to slow down the satellite. Um, number one, apparently if the satellite is spinning very quickly, the solar panels are not very effective in charging up because they, they see the sun only for a short while, they go into eclipse. The other thing is um, if your radio is sort of directional, then you, you want to sort of slow it down as well. So typically, what they do is they would actually have a little ma uh, magnetic sensor on board, and they can actually detect how the satellite is actually or in, is, is moving around because it's in the Earth's magnetic field. And then they would actually um, run a little bit of current to around the solar panels. Because if you look at the way the solar panels are built, they, 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 it's a printed circuit board, and there's a little uh, trace. And if you run the current through it, it's like a little electromagnet. Uh, and so it can actually counteract the Earth's uh, magnetic field, and it will slow down. So that's one way to do it. So you don't have to use any fuel to do that? Uh, no, we don't have to do, use any fuel so to do that. Yeah. Well, but it keeps getting recharged. It get, it gets yeah. recharged uh, through a solar panel. Now, for faster attitude control, for example, if uh, you want to point one face of the satellite where perhaps your primary telescope aperture is towards a particular point, they will use reaction wheels. So these are spinning wheels, uh, or typically three of them in a particular axis, and then they would spin it a particular way so that a particular uh, face is pointing in the direction that you want. Um, fuel typically is used uh, for station keeping. So there's a concept where people would um, put some kind of thruster okay, uh, on, the, on the satellite itself, and as it degrades in altitude, they will release this, this gas or, or, or jet of particles so that it will be pushed up in, uh, into a higher altitude and maintain its life in space. Yeah, so there are, there are different ways to do it. You can't explain that without saying, Captain, the orbit's decaying. <laughs> <laughs> Everything goes like that. All right, right, right. Yes. <laughs> What's the magnitude of the current that you put in the loop in order to counteract the rotation of the satellite? Yeah, it's, it's, it escapes my, my mind at the moment. I don't have a magnitude for you. Um, but I remember it's not a lot because typically this, this has to uh, run when the satellite is deployed. Okay, so the, uh, depending on charge inside the battery. Uh, another way to do it is actually sometimes they put permanent magnets onto some parts of the uh, satellite so that there's a hysteresis as it rotates in the Earth's magnetic field, and that would normally slow it down. Wait, I'm sorry, just to make sure I understand, are you using like currents of wire like reaction wheels for like orientating the, the thing? Two things. So the, the, the wires that are part of the printed circuit board, uh, are built in, so that's not a mechanical thing. It's, it's electro um, the EMF. Uh, if you want to have a faster orientation, then there are mechanical wheels uh -huh. uh, that are placed inside the satellite. Okay, but the currents can sort of have that same effect on a smaller scale. Um, you would, because the satellite also is, has mass, uh -huh. so you probably have to run more current than uh, it, than, okay. than is preferred. That's really cool. Yeah. Yeah, it's in space, so there's nothing holding you back. I think it's more about the precision with which you can actually manufacture them. So I've seen um, that the reaction wheels are about two to three inches across, so that one reaction wheel package will already take up one U of a, of a cube set. Yep. And then it's kind of a simple question. You referred to a transfer rate between the satellite and the ground. Yes. So what, is, like, what does that mean with, like, when you transfer quantum information from the satellite to the ground? Right. What does, what does that mean? So typically, we work in something called discrete variables. It means we are counting uh, individual photons. So typically what we would do is we would uh, have a source that can actually produce, like, maybe, here's a number, uh, one million photons a second. And then you put that into a telescope, you transmit it to the other end. And the question is, how many of those make it? How many can you count in your detector? Yeah. And, and that's the hundreds per second, or is there also a distillation process? That's 
I'm, I'm talking about the raw, raw rate. Uh, uh, and then the, with a distillation process, you could also get to a few hundreds, uh, 100 bits per second or so. It really depends on, on the protocol, like how much distillation are you going to actually uh, use. So like, how do you uh, distinguish between you know, your photons and all the other right. photons? Yeah, great question. So we use time. So when, when the photons leave the satellite, typically we, it has a twin which is kept on board. So we write down the time when it was seen. Okay? And then on the Earth, you write down the time when it arrived, and then you actually compare them. So we can use time to do that. So at the moment, we are not yet doing that on using the CubeSats. But our Chinese colleagues have already done it, and they're also using time. Where do you get your time reference from? Um, typically, there's a couple of ways. You can, you can rely on GPS if you wanted to, but you could also use a, a time transfer from the satellite. Because in order for the satellite to connect to the ground, you typically would have a beacon, a classical s signal, typically a laser, uh, going from the satellite to the ground, and vice versa. And you can actually modulate this beacon so that you do a time transfer between them. Yeah, so there's a few ways of doing that. Yeah? How do you keep the system alive? Which system? The, the optics. Uh, oh, I'm going to come to that. So let's, let's go to that. So how do we keep the system aligned? Let's start by looking at the spacecraft. Right? So this is Spooky 1, 1U one uh, avionics, okay? And then we have a 2U system for our experiment. We call it the science package. Okay? Uh, if you want an acronym, it's SPECS2. Now, what we did first was we, we designed a, a special isostatic mount uh, that would decouple the science package from the frame of the satellite. Because the satellite is in low Earth orbit, right? so it would see the uh, sun for about 60 minutes, and it will go into the eclipse for 30 minutes. So there's a big variation in you know, the hot and cold that the satellite will experience. And these things are made of aluminum, so they will expand and contract. And so we wanted to sort of re, uh, be decoupled away from that. Okay? So we worked with uh, some colleagues in, in Australia uh, who's got a lot of experience working with, uh, with ABUS on satellite systems. And then they, they actually miniaturized a design for us, which we detailed out. If you look at the exploded model of our, our science package, this would be the uh, custom interface structure on top of the, the satellite structure itself. And then this is our isostatic mounts. Okay? It's three little uh, stainless steel blades put into a, a particular shape. And then we have our electronics board, which runs our laser, uh, our single photon detectors, uh, and also it collects all the scientific data. Right? And we put a little heater on it. Okay, and then this is uh, the main optical unit. Okay, and then we cover it with a little piece of aluminium. In terms of the, the optical components, the important bits would be the pump laser over here. It will pump two uh, BBO crystals, right? And it will produce uh, entangled polarization entangled photon paste after the final compensator. And then these two photons have different colors. Right? There's a, so they're non-degenerate. Um, one of the photons would, would be transmitted to a single photon detector over here, and the other one would be reflected by a dichroic mirror into this single photon detector. And then in front of the detectors, we have polarization uh, analyzers. So there's a polarizer and a liquid crystal. Uh, we didn't use a, a half-wave plate because the half-wave plate will rotate and impart inertia to the satellite. Yeah. So we use liquid crystals. Uh, there's a little bit of a story with the liquid crystals because when I first presented this at a space conference, they said, no, liquid crystals are verboten in space. <laughs> but actually, it turned out to be OK. It, it worked. And, and more, more, more teams are, are using that now. But it's kind of amazing that the angular momentum of a light is something that you have to worry about for the orientation of a satellite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in a way, it, it is. No. Yeah. It's not the the of the oh, no, of the wave plate. As you rotate the wave plate, as you select the... Oh, because oh. you're rotating when you're doing the selection. So it's not, it's not the, 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 the angular momentum of the light. Okay, ah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, that makes a lot more sense. Right. 
Did you measure the vibrational spectrum of the platform? Yes, we did. Uh, yeah. uh, you, you have to watch out for the uh, resonance frequency uh, of the entire package. And I'll show you a picture of that. Right here on the space station, for example, that's a big problem. Yeah, yeah. The space station is a, is a very, very noisy environment. Uh, I think uh, Nick Bigelow was in town recently. He, he told us about the, the Cal experiment. And he was, saying, he was pointing out that his experiment was next to the exercise bike that the astronauts were <laughs> 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 that's, uh, that's, that's keeping alignment, uh, a different challenge in keeping alignment. You don't have any toilets aboard. <laughs> <laughs> no, we don't. But we have this funny thing Sorry. over here, OK? Um, how, do we, how do we maintain alignment? So um, as you can see, we're using BBO to generate our down conversion. So it's angle tune. Right? So you have to maintain the, the angle of the uh, crystal with respect to the pump laser. Um, and so what we did was we, we had to, to design flexure stages. Um, this is probably overkill, but the way we did it was we made flexure stages out of uh, titanium. Okay? And then we would actually test it under different temperature conditions, test it also for its resonance frequency, just to make sure that if you put a BBO crystal in place and you turn the tuning screw, that will actually stay fixed. I think one of the biggest worries we had was that we were worried that during launch, um, this thing might actually tap, start tapping against uh, these components over here, and then the screw would actually release itself. So we also had to make sure that the amount of talk we put into it would be sufficient such that the force doesn't, doesn't cause that tapping. But I guess the other thing that we, we were mostly concerned about is that because the satellite is deployed from the space station, and the, sta the, the, the space station has a particular inclination, right? It's not a north-south inclination, like it goes over the poles all the time, or it's not equatorial, but it's, it's inclined at some angle to spend a lot of time over you know, populated areas. This means that it will precess with respect to the Earth. And so remember when I said that the satellite typically spends 60 minutes in the sun and 30 minutes in the Earth's eclipse, that's a typical orbit. But because of the precession, it can enter certain regions uh, of the calendar when it would you know, have no time in eclipse at all. It would be continuously in the sun. So this is another challenge that we were worried about. And that's why we, we made a lot of the components out of titanium, so that you know, the, the coefficient of thermal expansion was a little bit uh, smaller. Now, in terms of the, the way the BBO crystals are aligned, we did something else. Um, we, there's an entire zoo of, of ways in which you can actually generate polarization entangled photons, right? And some of them are, are more compact than others, and they all have different features. But the main thing we wanted to do was we wanted something compact, right? So we couldn't use this non-collinear uh, photon source setup. We wanted a collinear regime. And then we wanted to improve the efficiency or robustness of this, in the sense that if the detectors uh, got shifted from their housings, can we still see something, OK? And the way we did it was to take two BBO crystals and have them parallel, have their optical axis parallel to each other. So the, the pump light comes in, it will undergo spatial walk-off because it's extraordinary polarized with respect to the crystal. And when it's walking off, it will generate uh, photon pairs. So if you look at it at the end phase, you will see an ellipse, right? Uh, which uh, photon pairs are being generated. Now this is... Uh, you know, the photon pairs are, have the opposite polarization to the pump. And so we will insert a half-wave plate that will rotate the polarization of the SPDC, but not of the pump. So now after the half-wave plate, the SPDC photons and the pump have the same polarization, and they will undergo walk-off again. And it, while this is at the end of the second crystal, the photon pairs from the first crystal and the second crystal will more or less overlap spatially. Okay? So we actually have a, a relatively broad region in which we can collect photon pairs from. 
So that was another way in which we, we tried to improve the, the ruggedness of the system. And it, it, it worked quite well. I mean, um, we tried it out with crystals of different lengths. Uh, we opened up the, the aperture that was selecting it. And we could maintain a, a, a fidelity to the preferred entanglement state you know, for hundreds of thousands of, of detected photon pairs uh, per second. So, so that gave us some, some confidence that it would work. So in the end, in the flight model, uh, we model the aperture of the pump with respect to the crystals. We also model how the SPDC photons would be generated. We didn't put in a lens, right? Because we just wanted to, to see that these things were aligned producing high quality entanglement. So in the models, our uh, detector active area is this green spot, and then the SPDC photons being produced from the crystals sort of overlap in this area over here. And then coming to telemetry, we built our own UHF stations. Uh, you can buy the, the stations uh, and this equipment from GOM Space to ship it to you. It even comes with tracking systems. Uh, so once you get the, the two-line element from NORAD, you can just key it into the uh, controller and it will just track the satellites automatically. But because it's UHF, right, which is a really old technology, lots of people are using it. Right, and so we made a decision that we didn't just want to have a, 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 an antenna in Singapore, which is on the rooftop here. We also wanted to have someone relate uh, another copy in a place that was relatively quiet. And so we chose to, to, to work with Christoph in Switzerland, which turned out to be a pretty good choice because this is the heat map of the noise floor or the radio frequency noise floor comparing Singapore to, to Switzerland. And you can see that in Singapore, it's really noisy. And one of the, the reasons for this is that we are a very you know, massive port. And there's lots of ships uh, around Singapore. And they often communicate with each other using UHF. And it's all uncontrolled. So it's difficult to say, I want a particular frequency that's noise free. Okay. What does that, the angle indicate on those diagrams, Alan? Which one? This? Yeah, well, 45 degrees. This would what is the angle of perspective one? Oh, that's, that's with respect to like, you, know, you, you choose a, a particular this direction the and then you, you, you sweep it around. Right. So um, we started putting things together, right? And we also started to, to shake them and put them in thermal vacuum chambers. <laughs> um, so typically over here, uh, we would shake everything randomly up to 7.1 GLMS and we would look for resonance frequencies. Right? And the idea is that the satellite or the rocket pro, uh, launch provider will give you a reference table and saying this is play, uh, the range of frequencies where you don't want to have any uh, you know, resonance. Because if you resonate with the, space, uh, with the rocket, then things can really get shaken to pieces. And the other thing is we also tested in a thermal vacuum chamber to, to simulate what happens in space. Uh, and so it all worked out. Uh, it was all fine. Right? So we actually you know, deployed it from the space station. And this is a, a two nice photos from the astronauts as they took a photo of Spooky One. This was leaving the, the Japanese module. Hey, quick break for questions. Okay. Yes. What's the difference between BBO1 and BBO2? They're identical uh, BBO crystals. There, there's no difference between them. We, we have them cut in the same way, right? Because we want them to produce uh, SPDC photons in the same way. What we do is how do we erase the which way information is by making sure there's a good spatial overlap. Yeah. Yeah, so I'll, I'll come to that. I have some models for that, about how much losses we expect. Okay, okay let's move on. Um, so once the, the satellite launched, right, uh, it became a race against time because we launched around this point and very soon we are going to enter one of this satellite, you know, uh, eternal days. <laughs> so we wanted to try and get some experiments done before that. 
But one of the big challenges we had was that um, for this cube set, the control is not very good. It will slowly still spin. What we're doing is we're slowing down the rate of spin. But it's very difficult, uh, or at least Spooky One didn't have the ability to always, say, maintain the, the long face towards the, the sun. Okay? And so it will, it will slowly rotate. Uh, and so that made you know, predicting the temperature uh, on board a little bit challenging. And what we didn't want to do was we didn't want to take the risk of turning on the components when it was too cold. For example, if the pump laser is rated to work at above 15 degrees Celsius, and typically you know, in a, in a single orbit, the temperature can be as low as minus 5 degrees Celsius and as high as 10 degrees Celsius, and it'll always be about there. Okay? Uh, and so this means that you need to know when to turn on the heater okay, so that the temperature reaches something that's acceptable, and then you can turn on the experiment. So we spent a lot of time in the first few days you know, trying to, to write down like when we actually see uh, uh, eclipse, when do we see you know, daylight, what's the, the range of temperatures. It was a matter of, of trial and error, trying to, to figure out when was the correct time to turn it on. Um, it turned out also that there was a slight mistake in the, in the thermal modeling of the system. Um, we didn't expect it to get this cold, okay? And so our heater was a two and a half watt heater. And it turned out that it was just at about the limit at which heat was leaving the satellite. Okay, so it's always fighting against uh, the uh, rate of heat loss. But having said that, in the end, it did work. Okay, we managed to get our first uh, polarization correlation curves in July. Right? And this is just as a comparison, the contrast uh, of the curves uh, in space uh, against something that we had on the ground as a baseline. Now, one of the main reasons why it did work for us was that we had built a lookup table, right, of what is the optimum laser current for, uh, against a laser temperature. Because it turns out that the laser we were using is, um, has an ex uh, external cavity built into it, right? And so the, the mode that's being selected by this laser uh, is, a, is a rich interplay of the current and the temperature. But there's a very nice like, you know, slope you can see over here, right? so that for every temperature, there's always some current that will give you a, a high contrast visibility right? in terms of the polarization correlations. And so you, this, combined with an understanding of you know, how the temp temperature on the satellite would, would change, allows us to, to, to generate this nice plot over here, where you know, we're always above 2. Right, so we could actually demonstrate that there's entanglement being produced. And remember I said about you know, this long exposure to the sun, these three data points actually came after the satellite had been exposed to the sun for a while. And during that time, it would reach temperatures, internal temperatures of about 40 to 45 degrees Celsius. So there was always a concern of whether you know, the, the entire alignment would actually survive, and it did. And this is, uh, you know, data, right? The ones over here are from the previous slide, but we've been operating it for over uh, 600 days, okay? And so, you know, there's a couple of things that we, we, are, we are pretty satisfied with. We believe that the, the bulk entangled photon sources work quite well in space, but we still think that the UHF radios are hard to operate because you see this little gap here of like a few hundred days, the radios uh, in Singapore and in Switzerland stopped working, right? And so we had to try and fix it. And then when we fixed it, there was a lot of noise coming in. So there was a period of time when we couldn't really get any experiments, not because there was something wrong with the satellite or because there was something wrong with the experiment, but simply because of the, the UHF technology. Uh, but after that, you know, we could continue to, to collect you know, reasonably high quality entangled photons. Okay, so I would say we have been really satisfied with the performance of the entangled photon source, and then we want to understand the effects of aging in space. Uh, what happens as these components are placed in space? Do we see any degradation of the components?
And one of the biggest things that we worry about is radiation. This is the typical proton uh, flux concentration in low of orbit. This is the one for electrons. Uh, but because electrons have, have very small mass, they're often stopped by the surface of the satellite. So we're mostly concerned about protons. And then the other thing that we, we got to do was observe how the rate of radiation damage will increase with the altitude, with the height of the satellite above ground. Because as the, the closer you get to Earth, the more there's a shielding effect from the Earth's uh, magnetic field. And could we actually see an effect? It turns out that I think we can. The way we see radiation damage on the components typically is in the form of uh, increased noise threshold. Uh, and in particular, for the single photon detectors, this means that the, the rate of dark counts will increase. So if you don't turn on any experiments, you just turn on the detector, the, rate, the background rate you know, coming from the detector will simply just go up with time. And so this is the dark count rate for different temperatures of the detectors, APD1 and APD2, over the 600 days that we are monitoring it. And you can see that there's one slope here, and then there's another slope over here. And it, it was consistent for all the different operating temperatures. And you look at it against altitude, there's also a little period over here where there's a, a sort of a kink where the satellite started to come down towards the Earth much more quickly. And it, it sort of corresponded with this, this time over here. Okay, so we sort of have a good understanding that the radiation damage okay, incurred by the detectors really is a function of the, the altitude in space. This means that in the future when you're selecting for which height you want to operate the satellite in, this could actually be an important parameter. The other interesting thing is that can we, suppose you have to live with this radiation damage, can you do anything to remove it? Um, and it turns out that you can. You can actually apply heat to it, okay? And this heat will cause the uh, silicon atoms inside the detector to anneal so that the, the radiation damage, which is in the form of intermediate energy levels in the, in the band gap, they will go away. Uh, and so there are, there are different ways to do it. Um, we have always been putting them in an oven just to test you know, irradiated detectors. Uh, Thomas Genowine uh, is, is pursuing another approach where he's using lasers. He's using lasers, shining them into the detector and heating them up using optical power. All right? um, but we've, we've been continuing our own approach, which is just to use heat. And what we did uh, recently, and I apologize for these small numbers because you know, this is very recent data from our lab. But what we've been doing to apply heat is not putting the whole thing in an oven, but using the thermoelectric cooler that is actually built into the single photon detector can. Uh, those of you who have worked with these detectors will understand that they come in a little TO can, right? And sometimes there's a th thermoelectric cooler inside that you can actually cool it down to minus 20 degrees or so. But you can also run this cooler in reverse, okay, so that the active area is heat being heated up. And we've done a couple of experiments where we uh, annealed the detector for 14 hours each time okay, to see whether there was any improvement. And around 110 degrees of, of annealing temperature, uh, that's when we begin to see almost full recovery of the, single, uh, of the radiation damage. Now, this is not in space, this is on the ground. And one of the things that we are talking with Thomas and people like Paul Cuyat, who's trying to put some of the next experiments in space, is how we would actually uh, do an annealing test using the thermoelectric cooler. Um, follow on projects, what are we going to do next? Now we, we know that we have a particular design that will work. We are interested now in building the next satellite, which is equipped with a telescope so that you know, some of the entangled photons can actually be transmitted away. Uh, and this is a relatively you know, active activity for the community who work with uh, quantum technology and CubeSats. Here, I present a small design that we did with MIT. Right? Uh, they call it a Richie Christian layout. It has a 95 millimeter uh, primary telescope with a fast steering mirror. Let's see, over here, this fast steering mirror they will actually allow the small fine adjustment 
so that the beam can actually track the ground station. Uh, and the design seems viable. It seems like it can be put into a 6U uh, CubeSat. Okay? And this is something that we're, we're, we're seeing how to, we can actually get such a, a sample built. Right? We're also continuing to look at different uh, entangled photon uh, sources, uh, typically all built out of bulk crystals. You know, there's, the trick is always you know, to, to find some way of erasing the, the which way information, which tells you in which path the photon pairs are born. Our latest design is mostly in, uh, based on, on this setup, where instead of using BBO crystals for the down conversion, you, you, you create them inside periodically pulled KTP. And then there are two paths. And we just use the BBO as a uh, you know, beam splitter. Uh, another possible approach would be to just you know, pump a PP KTP crystal with a single beam and then spatially separate them into two parts. Right? And then we, we just recombine them. So these are things that we are working on. Now, often the parameter here is uh, stability and brightness. Right? We want to be able to generate lots of photon pairs Right, and then couple them into single uh, mode fiber because the single mode fiber would define the, the spatial mode that can actually be mapped to the telescope efficiently. Uh, if you just use the, the free spatial modes coming out, the PPKTP crystals, they cannot be mapped to the telescope efficiently for transmission and you lose most of them anyway. So we, we often try to actually couple it to the single mode fiber and then launch it through the telescope and then we study how much loss there is in the free space link between the telescope and a ground receiver. So over here, um, I show you the link loss, right, for three different choices of your altitude. You can be in low Earth orbit, right, which is relatively close to the Earth, about 400 to 500 kilometers. You can be in medium Earth orbit, tens of thousands of kilometers away. Or you can be in geostationary orbit at 36,000 kilometers, right? And for a given satellite aperture and the pointing error, okay, of your satellite, uh, this is the link losses that you can see. And so for low Earth orbit, you know, if you have a large enough uh, transmitter, you can have a link loss as low as minus 1.5, 15 dB, right? which is actually something very nice. But even if you don't have that, you, you have perhaps something about a 10 centimeter uh, aperture, your link loss is still about minus 24, 25 dB. And this is for the downlink approach. An uplink would be worse because it has a shower curtain effect. The signals, the optical signals will go through the atmosphere first where there's more turbulence. So it'll, it'll be spread out more by the time it arrives at a uh, detector. However, this tells you that the geostationary approach is going to be really, really challenging. I'll just show you a, a simple comparison. Okay? This is the distance from the Earth, and this is what we call a raw rate of signals received from the satellite uh, over a period of a year. And sometimes, you know, we think that the geostationary satellite is always on station, so it's easy to work with because you can just point your receiver at it and and harvest the signals coming from it, although it's at a very low rate. However, that doesn't work very well because there's still diffraction. Okay? The optical beam is going to diffract. And so for the same size uh, telescope, right, you're almost always going to be far better in the low Earth orbit regime. Okay? And you zoom in onto this regime over here in this graph, you see that indeed you do get a little improvement okay? from geostationary orbit, but you, you cannot overcome the diffraction losses. So it's going to be very challenging. So my preference is to work with low Earth orbit satellites. Uh, we have started to do in-lab testing, you know, putting the, the sources together with the detectors, uh, coupled in with all the distillation uh, post-processing software, and just trying to, to mimic what happens as you increase the loss, right? And you can see that the the quantum bit error rate between the satellite and the ground receiver will start to rise at above, uh, once the losses hit about minus 30 dB, right? But still, it sort of works. You can generate a secret key. Uh, we use the secret key as a, as a measure of how effective the communication has been. 
uh, all the way to about you know minus 40 dB or so. So this is this is uh, you know um, more evidence that we believe that we can work with low Earth orbit satellites that are equipped with bulk entangled photon sources. Uh, beyond just you know direct transmission of entangled photons from space to ground or ground to space, we want to be able to, to understand a few things. Right? Just like our, our Chinese colleagues, we want to understand what it means to build a constellation of quantum satellites in space. Okay? Uh, this is a, a very naive picture where the satellites are sort of distributed uh, equally. But you know, just like how the space station has a particular inclination, you probably want to optimize your constellation if you're thinking of service delivery, because the populated areas are only over specific regions. For example, if you think of you know, linking up cities in the Mediterranean, then they are, they're laid out in a particular way right, around the Mediterranean Sea. If you think of, of countries in Southeast Asia, then it's more like a blob, uh, a circular blob. So constellation uh, optimization is, is, a, is a big engineering task, which is kind of interesting to, to look at. And from a research perspective, a science and research perspective, trying to understand how to put quantum memories, um, whether in space or on the ground, how to think of the architecture of such a network is also very interesting. Right? Uh, so these are things that you know, we, are, we are looking at with colleagues around the world. So finally, I guess uh, I'll just give you a quick summary. Right. Uh, the, the small satellites have worked out very well for us because they have a very short you know, design launch life cycle. So in about 12 years, we could go, go to three or four different uh, launch campaigns, which is like well within the lifetime of a PhD student. So they get very motivated when they work on it. The other thing is small university teams can launch and operate small quantum satellites. Okay, uh, you know, The right share approach, putting lots of satellites onto a single rocket works because it helps to reduce your cost. Um, we like the, the bulk entangled photon sources. They work very well now. But we're also looking at how some of these on-chip devices, whether it's uh, on-chip in, in a crystal or four-wave mixing in a, in a silicon uh, or silicon nitride uh, platform, we like to see how, how well they work. Uh, in particular, whether we can extract them off the chip efficiently. Um, UHF radios, if you can avoid it, <laughs> For your space missions, please do. It's just very difficult to work with. The single photon detectors are definitely radiation sensitive, right? But you can anneal away the damage. But I think there's still a lot of research that can be done to improve uh, the radiation tolerance of these devices. Uh, I think power is still a challenge. We have solar panels, but I think um, getting you know, low power uh, electronics is always very important, and we should think about how to actually generate even more power on the satellite, perhaps by uh, using you know, deployment uh, wings where there are solar panels attached to it, just to increase the surface area. Uh, finally, I, I think that low Earth orbit is good for optical quantum communication from space, but I think very low Earth orbit could be better. Right? Yeah. So with that, I'd like to thank everyone for your attention. And one last thing, uh, we are hiring, you know, if you, if there are people who want to come and work as postdocs or as PhD students, we, we definitely have uh, opportunities available. Thank you.